Good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're listening from. I thought I'd try something a little different today, a little bit more unscripted and and freeform. Uh, Most of the videos I do are scripted. I just want to say a quick thank you to all my recent subscribers and to announce that I will be having a conversation with Morgoth's Review later this week. Uh, on Friday the 7th of April, we'll be sitting down and having a conversation. I'm not sure yet if that's being live streamed. Um, if it is, you'll obviously see it being prepared and you'll you'll click on it, hopefully. Uh, if not, then I'll upload it afterwards and I'm sure you can find the video. You'll be able to find the video on his channels as well. So I recommend subscribing to him. He's a really interesting chap and I look forward to talking with him. Uh, but I wanted to talk today about um, the Matrix and the machine, not the Matrix the movie, although that certainly comes into it, but the idea of the machine and the idea of plugging or unplugging from it. Um, I don't know how to define the machine. It's used a lot by right wing thinkers. Um, Paul Kingsnorth, for instance, the novelist who's very much unplugged and sort of he lives in Ireland now with his family and he very much lives off the fat of the land, as Lenny says in Of Mice and Men grows his own food, has his own chickens, um, uses the internet, but rarely. Um, Living very much the life I would like to live, to be honest. But he's succeeded in unplugging because he understands the threat that the machine poses. If I were forced to proffer a definition of the machine, I think I would struggle with the dictionary definition, but I think a good way of describing it would be our inability to lead the kind of life that our our elites don't want us to lead. And what I mean by that is, if you look at the matrix, you know, on a literal level, what you're seeing is humanity being used as batteries. You've got this kind of, um, well, it reminds you of modern day China in a way, when you, when you rewatch the movie, when you see what the Chinese are doing, not just to their own people, but in terms of the scale and immensity of their factory farms. Um, I mean, architecturally, that they look very similar to the huge sort of battery pillars, I suppose you could call them, in which the human beings are plugged in in the Matrix and being used as batteries. But on a literal level, that's what you're seeing in the Matrix. Human beings used as batteries in a far distant future. And there's this, obviously, there's this this band of, of lucky people who are able to unplug from the Matrix and transcend it and fight against it. And Neo's the one and so on and so forth. Everyone knows the story. And it occurred to me that everyone's talking about AI at the moment and the threat that poses. And I I do plan on doing a a scripted video essay on artificial intelligence and and why I don't think we have to worry about AI ever becoming self-aware and and conscious in the way that we we fear that they will, Um, which isn't to say that I don't think we should fear other aspects of, of its capability. But in all this talk about artificial intelligence at the moment, we are looking forward to the future. We're looking ahead into the future and, and wondering sort of when might this matrix scenario happen to us or when might this Terminator scenario happen to us? And I would contend that it kind of already has in the same way that we're kind of already living in a totalitarian society. We just don't have gulags, but we're living in a society that is on the same continuum as the gulag. Cancellation is effectively being sent to the gulag. It's just that you don't die at the end of it. But you do die a kind of death because your career and your reputation is completely taken away from you. So your your ability to, to sustain yourself in life meaningfully is whisked away from you. So I would argue that we are already living in the world that the Matrix describes to an extent. And I think it's only going to get worse before it gets better. And, you know, if you saw my recent video on on how the World Economic Forum and in in league with various national governments, which they admit to have infiltrated quite successfully with their ideologies, um, whether it's the UN, the European Union, the World Bank, um, billionaire figures such as Bill Gates. I mean, it all sounds very conspiratorial. It's easy to dismiss as the the ravings of someone wearing a tinfoil hat, but it's you know, when you look at the definition of conspiracy, um, which is basically you know, a group of people get together to plot something in secret, which could do other people harm, um, that is exactly what you're looking at. And when you look at the 
kind of world that is slowly but surely and inexorably being pushed upon us from above by all these elites who govern us, um, that is very much the Matrix world. It's a world in which you are ignorant. It's a world in which your life force, as it were, is, is dictated by ones and zeros. One zero, one zero, zero, one, one zero, one zero. Ah! And in which your ability to choose otherwise is taken from you. I mean, I, I had this conversation recently with, with someone in, in the pub where, you know, I was... He, he liked America and I, I like America. And we, we were talking about, you know, America is probably one of the countries left in the free world, at least. You, you can just about eke out a sort of frontier existence for yourself. I don't mean literally frontier, of course, but, you know, it's still just about possible in some American states, I, I gather, to, you know, grow your own food, to, to build your own house, to go and live on your own land, to be left alone, by and large, by the government. I mean, Texas doesn't have income tax, for instance, uh, nor does Wyoming, I think. Um, so it, it's still possible to be to, to have that lifestyle in a country like America. You'd be hard-pressed to try and live that lifestyle in, in Britain. There are too many laws, there are too many regulations that enable you to sort of exit willingly the machine the machine of bullshit jobs and constant notifications, internet access, social media, advertisements, and groupthink governed by a very narrow Overton window, which has been shifted somewhere to the left of Lenin. You know, that, that is the machine. That is the machine. And it, it, it was, you know, I don't want to go too deep into the philosophy, but the philosophy of the machine is, is, a modernistic philosophy. It, it, it's born of the Enlightenment. It's born of progress with a capital P. Its ideology is that if you only do what we say, the experts and the, the enlightened people and the science, the world will become inexorably better and it will be good for you if you do what you're told. And we can eliminate poverty and war and discrimination and, and so on and live in this sort of utopia, which is kind of what they're after. I mean, go to the World Economic Forum's website and look at their material on well almost anything, but fifteen minute cities is a good example. And look at the look at the artwork they draw up for it. It it, it is utopian in in every single respect. It's straight from the pages of uh, Zemyatin's We, or, or Huxley's Brave New World in a way. Although I'd much rather uh, <laughs> I'd much rather consume soma than eat the bugs. Um, but I digress. I very much plugged into the machine last year when I got a job as a PR, uh, sorry, as a copywriter at a PR agency. Now, I already hated um, public relations because I knew that, you know, venal politicians like David Cameron had not had any other jobs in their entire lives except in PR. I knew that it had this in incestuous relationship with, with politics and journalism and, and so on. Um, but I went into it nonetheless because I was a good writer and I, that's what I was hired to do and I was really happy because they were going to pay me more and I only had to go to London twice a week, which was bad enough as it was, to be honest. I moved out of London for a reason and every time I went back, I remembered the reason I did. Um, and it quickly became obvious to me that, that I'd made a terrible mistake because as nice as some of the people I was working with were, PR... PR from the get-go is just an awful industry. It's one of those industries that didn't exist before, certainly in its current form, came into existence and should go out of existence again. It, it has no reason to exist. My job was to write what the PR industry rather archly and narcissistically calls uh, thought leadership pieces, which is just a fancy way of saying... Uh, editorials, articles, you know, newspaper articles, op-eds, if you like. And I was writing them for our CEOs. I can't say, you know, I can't go into too much detail because I don't want to get involved in any legal battles, but I was writing thought leadership pieces, which still makes me cringe. Uh, the, word, the phrase still makes me cringe uh, for, for CEOs of various companies. And the managing director of the PR agency I was working for had basically established the agency as uh, 
how does she put it, amplifying the voices of ethical tech, whatever the hell that means. So you can kind of imagine the kind of woman I was working for. Uh, never really left London, um, except on holiday, you know, never had a proper job. Um, just very, I don't know, very sort of vapid and, and the kind of person who actually thinks that you're making a profound difference to the world when you say something nice about the company you're doing PR for, you know, isn't it wonderful that they've got, you know, 30% women in their, in their top brass, you know, aren't we wonderful doing such a revolutionary thing for the world? No, you're not doing anything revolutionary for the world. You're completely meaningless. But here I was writing these pieces and a lot of our clients were in the green energy industry and the um, facilities maintenance industry as well. So, you know, people in, who install fire alarm systems and lifts and so on. And I was, it, it very quickly became apparent to me that I was not able to infuse what I was writing with any degree of genuine originality or personality or humor. What they were after was boilerplate stuff that anyone could write, indeed that chat GPT could write, that meant nothing and conveyed nothing and was written in a language so simple that you may as well just replace words in C spot run. It was really depressing to have to write after a while because you you could never vary your what you were saying. You had to stick to the message. And I know that's the point of PR, but you know, why hire a copywriter if you're not going to let them do their job and infuse some originality into what they're writing and, and so on. But it, it also occurred to me that every single one of these clients was absolutely in hoc to ESG and to climate targets and to diversity, equity and inclusion. I mean, my God, our HR clients. I mean, on the one hand, HR is really easy to write for because you can literally say any bullshit whatsoever. And as long as it sounds nice and you throw in the odd equality or diversity, they'll lap it up and they'll think it's genius. But every one of our clients was totally in hock to the machine, to the matrix, to the prevailing ideology. And it, working in this job after about nine months, it, it just became totally soul crushing. Um, and I was reminded of Solzhenitsyn's uh, message to future generations who wanted to learn from the experience of Soviet communism in according to which he said live not by lies you know because you know they're lying they know that you know that they're lying you know that they know that you know that they're lying and yet they continue to lie and that I think accurately describes the society in, in which we live at least to some extent uh, so it became a very depressing place to work because I was effectively being asked to lie. I mean, they didn't know my political proclivities. They couldn't have, and I wouldn't have shared them lest I receive the ultimate punishment of, of cancellation or just being sacked outright. But I, I was being made to write things that didn't actually have any relevance to what the clients did as a business, you know, whether they fixed a lift well or, or you know, were able to recycle a, a battery or anything like that. I was being asked to write about this sort of extra stuff that doesn't have anything to do with their business. Woke capitalism, in other words. And it, it just became totally intolerable. So I made the decision to quit. And this is sort of what I wanted to talk about. Because I imagine lots of other people are in the same position that I was in. Where you, you're having, you know, maybe you've had to do diversity training at work. Um, unconscious bias training, which I've had to do before, and I just fucking yeah, I, d I don't even know where to begin with that. Um, but plenty of people are obviously in this position where they don't feel that they're able to sign out from this. And I'm not saying that everyone is going to be in a position to do something analogous to what I was able to do, but I think my experience does show that. It can be done. You know, you don't, you might not expect it. You might have to wait a while, but the tide will turn eventually as more and more people come to see the lunacy of having to live this way, of not being able to sign out from the absolute madness that is modern society. 
So I quit my job. Uh, she, the manager had gone on a sort of firing um, Stalinistic purge almost. It was only a small agency, but she sacked about 80% of the employees. And I knew that I was next. And I wasn't going to give her the dignity. So, uh, or the satisfaction, rather. So I decided to leave with some dignity, and I, I quit before she could fire me. And I started working for... Uh, how would you describe it? I don't want to give the name away, but um, basically I'm restoring, helping to restore historic boats. The oldest one in the company's possession was built in early 1906, 1906, so before the First World War, which is incredible. Some of the planks on the boat are, are still original to 1906, but a lot of the others have been replaced. Um, my job, I'm what's called a third hand, third hand bargee, someone who works on barges, and my job is to help uh, fix them up, paint, sand, varnish, carry things, lots of heavy lifting involved, um, so I'm becoming stronger and fitter and happier and sleeping better in the process. But that's what I'm doing now, and now my office is a river. You know, my office is... Uh, my my office my 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 lunch break room uh, everything about it is is you know rural and natural and fresh and organic not to sound too much like a hippie and it's it just feels wonderful to have exited in some small measure this dementing and debilitating regime that we're all forced to live under like so many rats and there's also the, the the practical element to it as well, the physical element. You know, so many people now, politicians in particular, I mean, they, they never know what it's like to do manual labor. And, and I had done manual labor before. I'd, I've worked in a flour mill. I've worked in um, a garden center, which is a semi-manual labor. And I've worked in a car factory. All of which I hated, by the way. I mean, and that's, that's part of the reason actually as well that I that I like working on the barges see all these other manual jobs that I was doing there they were ultimately meaningless you you didn't get any aesthetic satisfaction from them uh, the hours were brutal and ultimately you know what does it matter that you get to polish one more bull bar for a 4x4 Range Rover or something and then stick it on the factory line and Bob's your uncle you know you're not going to see that bull bar ever again it means nothing to you Whereas on the barges, you know, they're constant. They're, they're always moored at the same place in in the same town, and you know, I get to go out on trips on them on the weekend. Those are unpaid, but you know, why would you be paid for them? It's a privilege to be on them. But you're you're happy doing that kind of work, even though the hours are just as long and the work is just as hard, because at the end of every day, you can turn around and look at this beautiful piece of history, piece of English history, which you have contributed to the upkeep of. And that's what makes it satisfying. And moreover, you're not doing it for some stupid, you know, metropolitan woke boss. You're doing it for someone who has a passion for boats, just like you. And your colleagues aren't the kind of people who are going to report you to HR if you say the wrong thing, because we don't have an HR department. You know, our lunch breaks consist of getting a whole bunch of plastic chairs and setting them up on the stones outside the boatyard and sitting having you know, instant coffee and just shooting, setting the world to rights. And they're a fascinating bunch of people, too. I mean, it, it really struck me, actually, it reminded me of Brexit, where for, for at least a couple of years, we had all these city-dwelling elites telling us that the kind of people who live where I live and work the kind of jobs I now work were stupid. You know, they couldn't possibly know what was good for them. Well, here I am sitting having coffee with these apparently stupid people and they're anything but. They're, you know, they're one of them's a father, one of them's a grandfather, a couple of them are younger than me, there's a, there's a couple of girls, most of them men. Uh, and the, on the one hand, they'll be talking about their boats, and you know I'm much less clued up about boating terminology as they are, but I'm I'm learning. Uh, you know, have you did you see that gaff rig on the river last week? Um, you know, I got some lovely pine from such and such woodyard recently. I'm going to do up my all this boat talk on the one hand, and then on the other hand, they're quite happy to sit and talk about how one of them went on holiday and and saw the 
sort of relics of a, of a pyramid or, or whatever it is, you know, in Egypt or, you know, rode a camel in Jordan or, uh, um, you know, read this really interesting book or saw this really interesting documentary lately. And what they're saying is every bit is, as intelligent and well-informed and interesting as as you could hope for. So there's this, it really just brought home to me the, the, the patronization at the heart of the elites who govern us. And I had a similar experience just yesterday, in fact, where I went to my local my local pub and was trying to write some, some poetry, which is what I tend to do at the pub at that hour because it's usually empty. But it was quite busy this time around. There were three old blokes sitting on separate tables, talking quite loudly across the room to each other. And they started out talking about dentistry and how much they hated, you know, getting fillings and how expensive this and that was. And then they go into a prolonged discussion about the the social conditions of Victorian Britain as described by Charles Dickens in Great Expectations. And then go on to say how much they hated the BBC's recent adaptation of Charles Dickens' uh, Great Expectations because it was woke. So, you know, it just goes to show. But, uh, yeah, you can unplug if you want to. Um, I suppose there's no way to unplug completely. I mean, here I am sitting in front of a a plugged-in microphone using the internet to disseminate this incoherent ramble. Uh, None of us can fully extricate ourselves from the modern world in all its dementing ingloriousness uh, until there's some kind of you know butlerian jihad as described by frank herbert and i long for that day because i'm an unapologetic luddite Uh, but until then there are sort of incremental things that you can do to exit the machine to lessen your dependence on the prevailing ideology and technologies that hold people in servitude And I suppose getting a new job is one of those incremental ways. I suppose another way at the moment, given the sort of puritanism that's at work in the, particularly the woke movement, is I'm not the first to to see puritanism in it, is just to indulge in your vices a bit more. I mean, I'm anti-drugs, so I wouldn't recommend drugs at all. I think that they are cancerous on Western civilization. But a good whiskey and a good cigarette, which is what I have in front of me, Uh, won't go amiss. Uh, So that's all from me this time around. I'm sure I'll do another video like this in the near future where I just sit and ramble. Um, Let me know what you think of the format because I know a couple of other people on YouTube who do these sorts of things and I think they're really good at it. Whether I'm good at it is for you to decide. If you think this has been a complete displeasure, uh, do let me know and I will stick to scripted videos. But uh, if you did like it, also let me know, because hopefully I get better at speaking ad lib and can dispense some more thoughts in the future. Well, thanks for listening. Please do subscribe and uh, catch you later.